Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Real Talk, Prosecutors and the Rights Council. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to learn more about this important topic. My name is Steve Collins, and I'm a Senior Program Associate at the Justice Programs Office at American University. I'll be handling some of the technical components of today's webinar. Before we get started, I hand over the presentation to Genevieve. I want to go over how the webinar will work today. All attendees are currently muted. If you have a question during the webinar, please submit it using the Q&A panel located on the right side of the webinar screen. We've set aside a few minutes at the end of today's webinar to address any questions that come up. Today's webinar is being live captioned. To access this feature, just click on the multimedia viewer icon on the top right of your screen. This webinar is also being recorded and will be posted on the Justice Programs Office YouTube channel. As a final note, there will be a brief survey at the end of the webinar we would greatly appreciate it if you could fill out the survey. Your feedback will help us improve future webinars and should take less than a minute to complete. With all of that taken care of, it's my pleasure to turn over the presentation to Genevieve Citrin Ray. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Steve. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. I'm really excited to participate in today's webinar alongside Marlene Diener, the Deputy General Counsel from the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys, and Justin Bing on the City Prosecutor of Spokane, Washington. So just so everybody sort of knows what to expect today, um, you'll see a brief agenda. I'm gonna, I know not everybody is familiar with the Right to Counsel National Campaign, so I'm gonna talk through that. And we're gonna talk about uh, our work with prosecutors and APA, talk a little bit about this uh, Right to Counsel Prosecutor Roundtable we have, and then discuss the practical implications of the roundtable findings and the role of prosecutors in ensuring the right to counsel, and we'll close with some Q&A. Um, as he said, there's a Q&A function where you can submit questions. Feel free to submit them throughout the webinar, and we'll just get to them at the end. So first, the Right to Counsel National Campaign. Who are we and what do we do? Um, right to Counsel National Campaign, or R2C, as we like to call it, is part of a cooperative agreement funded by the U.S. Department of Justice's Bureau of Justice Assistance. We provide leadership and information to policymakers and criminal justice stakeholders to ensure the fulfillment of the Sixth Amendment right to counsel and the effective delivery of public defense services. We, use, we are a public awareness initiative, and we use value-based communication to inform policymakers and criminal justice stakeholders in the public about these issues. Our goals are to raise public awareness nationally about the importance of providing skilled public defense services to criminal defendants who cannot afford a lawyer at every step of the way, to spirit broad-based initiatives by policymakers in multiple sectors, both within and outside of the criminal justice system, to take appropriate actions, and to develop a strategic vision of the role of public defense the policymakers and criminal justice leaders can integrate into the operational conduct and planning of the functions of their respective agencies, and make sure that the criminal uh, defense voice, public defense voice, is included in all criminal justice reform conversations. So Right to Council National Campaign is made up of a multidisciplinary group of uh, consortium members. As you can see, today we're going to be focusing on prosecutors, but we are a wide range of individuals that include law enforcement, judges, legislators, funders, community advocates, impacted community members, court personnel, policymakers, corrections, academia and researchers, and last but not least, defenders. So just a little bit of background of kind of why prosecutors, why we are targeting every aspect of the criminal justice system and all system actors and what we have done. So we firmly believe that to make any type of sustainable change requires the communication and coordination among all stakeholders. So each group plays a unique and critical role and without engaging everyone, change can't happen. So in, to make sure that the Sixth Amendment right to counsel is fully realized, we really need to speak with everybody involved in the system and everybody plays an active role in making sure this happens. So before we sort of kind of got off on focusing on all of the different stakeholders, we did this public opinion research because we don't know what we don't know. So we engaged in a year-long public opinion research to figure out what the public knew. And then after that, we started working with national organizations and held roundtables with the individual criminal justice system actors, including one with prosecutors with the support of APA, and to explore these issues and take a deeper look into the specific role each group plays. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it now over to Marlene to talk a little bit more about what APA's involvement has been and the role of prosecutors. Thank you, Genevieve. Um, so as Genevieve said, my name is Marlene Diener. I am a Deputy General Counsel with the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys. And I just wanted to start off by giving a little bit of background on who APA is and what we represent as an association. 
So APA is a national nonprofit organization. We're located in Washington, D.C., and we serve prosecutors as well as their community partners. And APA is dedicated to supporting and enhancing the effectiveness of prosecutors in their efforts to create safer communities, ensure justice, and uphold public safety. So why is APA involved in Right to Counsel campaign, and what does the Right to Counsel mean for prosecutors? So as you all know, the Right to Counsel is a constitutional right. It's found in the Sixth Amendment of the United States Constitution. And that right is guaranteed for all criminal prosecutions. So as prosecutors, we value fairness and we are ministers of justice. So by increasing communication between councils and getting public defenders involved earlier on in the process, the system is more effective and it's more just. And fairness and equal justice also have to do with being properly funded. So with financial constraints facing both prosecutors and public defenders alike, it's necessary that public service attorneys get the resources that they need and are properly sourced. So in order for the criminal justice system to function properly and efficiently, all system actors need to be working together to lift each other up. And it's the responsibility of prosecutors as well as defenders to work towards this goal together in order to improve the larger system of criminal justice. So what's APA's role uh, as a national organization involved in this campaign? So in addition to our work on the National Right to Counsel campaign with American University, um, and Genevieve will discuss that in greater detail in just a few moments. APA has also partnered with other national organizations, such as the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers and the National Legal Aid and Defender Association, or NLADA, to support this work. Um, and so we've done a few things, but I briefly want to highlight APA's work with NLADA. Um, APA and NLADA formed a partnership through the MacArthur Foundation Safety and Justice Challenge, which is an initiative that provides support to local leaders from across the country who are tackling the misuse and overuse of jails. And later on, you'll hear from Justin Bingham um, from Spokane, um, who are one of those sites. So APA and NLADA teamed up to bring together four jurisdictions from across the country who are participating in the Safety and Justice Challenge to discuss how they were collaborating on the policy level and implementing changes to their respective offices, but also still maintaining their traditional roles inside the courtroom. So from this meeting, we jointly authored a publication titled Beyond the Adversarial System, Achieving the Challenge. And this publication reveals concrete practical steps that were taken from this meeting that we believe are beneficial to achieving productive working relationships between prosecutors and public defenders. And we developed nine recommendations that are aimed at promoting and improving successful collaborations between public defenders and prosecutors. And I'm not going to go through all of them today, but I did just want to highlight uh, our first recommendation, which is to come to the table with reasonable goals and points of agreement. And defenders and prosecutors share many goals and encounter some of the same obstacles in achieving them. So identifying some of those goals and starting a conversation from that point will signal that each side understands and respects the other's position. And for example, public defenders and prosecutors share a desire to improve the justice system. Everybody can agree on that. So when prosecutors are intentional about building positive relationships, that trust is then developed and then a collaborative partnership can form where sustainable change is created. So I just wanted to wrap up by explaining why prosecutors should support this work and should be involved in the right to counsel. So the Right to Counsel campaign really emphasizes the importance of fostering better communication, um, better innovation and leadership and relationships with all state criminal justice systems. So providing support and resources for public defenders will help the system run more efficiently and overall improve the quality of justice. There is a need for a unified vision of public safety among all system actors in the criminal justice system and establishing a just an efficient system of representation is contingent on widespread change and support from state and local governments, as well as all system actors. And prosecutors as leaders can play a really big role in making that happen. And so with that, I just want to turn it back over to Genevieve. Thank you so much, Marlene. Um, and I'm really glad that you highlighted, you know, collaboration, efficiency, and kind of improving the quality of justice. That's really, you know, what we firmly believe is that when everybody works together, you might have different angles and you may be focusing on things, but, you know, the wheels of justice, you can make them run more uh, smoothly and more efficiently. And so 
kind of with that in mind and trying to figure out what prosecutors on the ground think um, about the right to counsel, we worked with APA to hold um, a round table of prosecutors. This was held in Washington, D.C. on December 12th. We had 10 state prosecutors and senior staff from prosecutor's office in attendance. And in this session, we really wanted to hear from prosecutors about kind of the perceptions of public defense systems nationally and in their jurisdictions and public defenders, what challenges faced by current public defense systems may exist, what is the prosecutor's role in ensuring the right to counsel and effective defense services? What are possible solutions? And then messages for prosecutors about public defense. So how can you get other prosecutors on board to help champion the right to counsel? Um, again, using this kind of this lens of value-based communication, which is what we, um, is our campaign is all about. So what did we learn? What we saw is that there's a general positive assessment of public defenders but there is a, a large feeling that public defenders are less experienced by than private attor defense attorneys. A lot of this came from the belief that pay is so low in public for public defenders that uh, public defenders tended to be newer and less experienced and they didn't stay in their jobs as long to become more seasoned. So then there is a constant kind of turnover and therefore the public defenders were a little bit less experienced. Um, there are a wide range of challenges that public defenders face, and they included heavy caseloads, low pay, like I mentioned, too few resources, and negative branding. So why do prosecutors think this matters, those in attendance? So kind of to echo a little bit of what Marlene was saying too, prosecutors have a responsibility to work with public defenders to create a more effective, efficient, and fair criminal justice system. When one part of the system is not working effectively, it's emblematic of a larger problem within the criminal justice system. And one bad, um, you know, bad wheel or spoke in the wheel can have an impact on all of the other pieces of it. Um, underfunctioning public defense system implies and leads to an underfunctioning criminal justice system overall. Improving public defense improves justice overall and effective public defense services legitimize court proceedings. So it's very clear that, round, that all the roundtable participants recognize the value and the importance of quality um, public defense and that there was a, a big need to kind of improve it. So kind of what can prosecutors do and what were some values that really spoke to them is what we explored next. So the values that really kind of resonated with prosecutors centered around fairness and justice, efficiency, and the Constitution. So below are just listed are two messages that we tested with prosecutors um, that resonated the most with them and to get other prosecutors on board and to speak generally about why public defense and a well-funded public defense system really matters. In America, every person accused of a crime should have access to a competent lawyer. It's a constitutional right that is basic to our belief in fairness and equal justice. The right to counsel is a matter of fairness. Everyone accused of a crime needs a lawyer in order to have a chance a chance of a fair and just outcome in court. The quality of justice a person receives should not be determined by how much money a person has. So what does this mean for you as a prosecutor? So better public defense systems are not only necessary to make criminal justice more effective and efficient, but it makes all the overall criminal justice system fair. Effective defense services impact how the entire criminal justice system operates. Ensuring the right to counsel and effective public defense can make the criminal justice system operate more efficiently and fairly and actually save money in the long run. Increased funding for public defense providers can increase the legitimacy of the courts. Over and over again, you've heard this narrative that public defenders operate with too high caseloads and far too few resources. You see the impact that underfunding uh, public defense systems have, which means that there really needs to be an increased funding to increase the legitimacy of the courts, help you know, increase and improve the quality of justice and the efficiency. Some prosecutors added as well that it's necessary to make improvements to public defense delivery systems for fairness because it's the right thing to do, whereas others said that we want good convictions that will stand up. So as you see, there's this um, belief across the board that both it's kind of fair, it's quality, and it's what's right, it's fundamental, it's part of our constitution, and it does increase the legitimacy of every single court case and it holds up convictions where they should be held up. So these were some general findings that we took out of kind of this overall message, but I, what I really would like to do is now turn to Justin to have him talk about what the, what the implications on the ground are of these findings and what it means to be a line prosecutor 
and to be an advocate for effective public defense delivery system. Thank you, Genevieve, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, participate in this webinar. Uh, as Genevieve uh, said earlier, uh, my name is Justin Bingham. I'm the city prosecutor for the city of Spokane, Washington. Uh, I've been an attorney for 18 years, and I've been a prosecutor for 18 years. So my entire legal career has really been focused on criminal law and uh, the area of prosecution. For the last four and a half years, I've been the chief prosecutor for the city of Spokane. Uh, in that time, I've really had an amazing shift in sort of what my day looks like. Um, I went from the courtroom to the policy room, and it has been startling, the difference on what you see as a line prosecutor and what you see as a policymaker. But that time that I've spent uh, in the courtroom, it really did help to uh, sort of color my view of what we need to do in this area. For all those years that I was in the courtroom, I worked many times in alternative court settings, uh, mental health court, veterans court, community court, and worked to relicense people through our community relicensing program. That really gave me a unique perspective on the role and the importance of public defense. And more importantly, taking that background, uh, putting it into play with uh, another role that I have now that really I'm proud of. I'm now serving my second term as a prosecutor representative on the Washington State Bar Association's Council for Public Defense. In Washington State, our Supreme Court and our bar believe that public defense has a special role to play and that we need to provide the necessary assistance and expertise to make it better. And prosecutors, for as long as we've had our council, have had representation on that council so that we can assist the council by providing our view on how this uh, system can be safer and also more efficient while helping to promote public defense. There are a lot of assumptions that you have as a prosecutor on what the life of a public defender is. And I will say that serving on the Council for Public Defense has really allowed me to take those assumptions and throw them in the trash bin. I have seen now firsthand uh, the struggles that public defenders face for everyday funding, the struggle, heck, to just even get in the door, to be in the court, to be able to represent people that can't afford attorneys, the struggle for equal pay, to retain good attorneys, and the ongoing struggle to fund investigations and expert witnesses at trial. The role and the world of a public defender is so much different to prosecutors. Their battles are different. Uh, we always get a seat at the table because we're the state. We're the individual or entity that is bringing the criminal action. So many times public defenders are in a place of conflict. They're fighting for access. They're fighting for funding. They're fighting against the evidence that we as prosecutors are bringing. As prosecutors, I, I truly believe we have to recognize the differences with public defense, but we also have to understand that we have an obligation to defend and advocate for the right to counsel. It's just innate in our being to do that because it's what we as lawyers should do. This project is so important because it not only seeks to educate people on the right to counsel, but it also seeks to bring together different people, to bring an understanding on who can be part of this campaign and to broaden the, the conversation. Uh, that really is the reason we need uh, to talk about this, to broaden the conversation so that more people understand why the right to counsel is so important. So I guess the question uh, that I would ask is why should prosecutors advocate for the right to counsel? Because I'm sure that's the reason you're here. That's the reason you're on this, this call today. Uh, the slide that I have is really just boiled down not only the findings from the work of R2C, but also just sort of my thoughts on what are the most important reasons that we should advocate for right to counsel. First and foremost, we as prosecutors are defenders of the Constitution. You hear that again and again. Uh, most prosecutors pride ourselves 
that we are rule followers and we are rule enforcers. Well, if we're going to be defenders of the Constitution, I think we have to be truthful in the fact that we can't simply follow parts of the Constitution that suit us. We have to follow all the Constitution. That includes the Sixth Amendment. And the Sixth Amendment is very clear, and our Supreme Court has made it very clear that individuals have access to counsel for their defense in all criminal prosecutions. So we as prosecutors, if we're going to defend the rule of law, we have to defend and advocate for people to have the right to counsel in all criminal prosecutions. It was mentioned that the whole point of this could also assist in making our criminal justice system more efficient. Many times, funders want to focus simply on the cost the cost of providing attorneys and how difficult that is for them to make their budget when they're having to pay for a lot of attorneys. Uh, some funders, whether it be uh, county commissioners, city council persons, uh, state legislators, uh, they have some maybe philosophical uh, problems providing uh, an attorney for someone that's been accused of a crime. But I think that's the most important point we need to make, that we're providing funding for attorneys, for people that are accused. These are people like you or I that may come into contact with the criminal justice system. And we can't put our own uh, sort of social judgment on that. The Constitution allows for it, and we need to make it happen. If we choose to be penny wise and pound foolish by limiting funding for public defense, we will, in effect, have a less efficient system. There will be costs associated with appeals, wrongful uh, convictions. There will be costs associated with ineffective assistance of counsel claims. There are not only that, but societal costs for people that would be convicted when they should not be. We are part of, as you heard, uh, part of the MacArthur's Foundation's Safety and Justice Challenge. It's a huge effort to really reform the criminal justice system and focus on the use of jails. Our efforts to reform the criminal justice system, they simply won't be successful if we don't address the need for representation. Many of the issues that we face in reform work today uh, really need the voice of the public defense community. Who's going to really push forward on the ideas of bail reform, equal access to justice, racial inequities in the criminal justice system, disparate impact of decisions the criminal justice system makes, or over-policing or other issues with law enforcement. It's probably not going to be uh, the prosecutor or the judge that's going to make arguments that really go towards basic tenets of our current system. There's a need for advocacy, and there's a need to hold the government to account public defenders are able to do that. They're dealing with some of the most vulnerable populations that come into contact with the criminal justice system, and their voice is needed and it is necessary. One of the most practical considerations that prosecutors have as to why we should advocate for the right to counsel is essentially our convictions have added legitimacy when criminal defendants have access to a competent lawyer. You know, it, it's fun to win. Uh, we all, as lawyers, want to win. But I don't know exactly how much fun it actually is when you're winning against someone that isn't really on the same footing as you. Our convictions, they, they are actually challengeable when we don't have that same footing on the defense side. And why go through that? Why not win legitimately? Why not succeed in court on your legal arguments based upon the fact that you have an adversary on the other side challenging you and bringing up points that need to be addressed? And not just an advocate, but a competent lawyer. There's been a lot of discussion about the need for standards, whether they be national or local. Um, as someone that's been highly uh, involved with the American Bar Association, I'll, I'll tell you, I believe in standards. Uh, standards really set the, the bar for what is expected. 
and we have to provide lawyers that are competent to be able to meet those basic standards. It shouldn't really matter whether or not you're rich or poor as to the level of representation you get or heck, whether or not you ha even have a lawyer. Uh, we all deserve to have an equal chance when criminal cases are brought against us. So convictions, legitimacy, it really, it really speaks directly to the need for us to advocate for the right to counsel. Prosecutors in general, we see ourselves as uh, ministers of justice, uh, that our client is beyond the state. It's not just the entity that's bringing the criminal case, but it's also to this greater cause of justice. So this fundamental belief in fairness and justice really demands that we vigorously advocate for the right to counsel. Uh, not just that we passively support it, but that we advocate for it. There's a lot of fear in the prosecutor realm that we really are stepping outside of our, our lane, uh, that prosecutors shouldn't be seen as trying to help public defenders because we're supposed to be adversaries. My position is we can be advocates and adversaries in the courtroom, but we can work on policy that's beneficial not only for our individual offices, but also beneficial for society in general. Um, we have to fight the negative stereotypes that people throw out about public defenders because that goes once again to legitimacy. So many times when I was in court, I heard uh, the term public pretender or uh, criminal defendant tell a judge that I want a real lawyer, not a public defender. Those stereotypes and those statements cannot be left just sitting out in the air unresponded to. It is our duty to ensure that those stereotypes are broken down. And that's really uh, our role to advocate for funding, to provide uh, for good attorneys, to keep and maintain training for young attorneys, and to really focus on pushing this responsibility not off onto others, but to take it on ourselves. Uh, this is our duty. It shouldn't be the responsibility of everyone else in the room. We don't have to always fight and argue with public defenders. Uh, we can fight with them when it's the right thing to do. And to advocate for someone to have their constitutionally demanded attorney, I believe, is well within our uh, responsibilities. Working on the, the Council for Public Defense and working with public defenders has honestly been one of the most enriching parts of my experience as a prosecutor, because you can see what they go through, and hopefully they can understand maybe some of the challenges that we have on our side as well. So I really challenge all of you to rethink maybe your preconceptions about how prosecutors can be part of this conversation. We don't have to be silent supporters. We honestly and truly should be vigorous advocates. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justin. Um, you really hit on a lot of important points. One being, you know, it's not just having a representative, but you know, a competent and effective defense counsel really can make a difference both on individual cases and for the larger systemic reforms, um, such as bail, bail reform and addressing kind of uh, racial and ethnic disparities in the system. Um, so thank you so much for your comments. Um, it's now kind of time for Q&A. And so while some people are thinking about what you want to ask, I'm just going to start this off um, by turning to you, Justin. You spoke a lot about kind of why it's important to advocate the power of having somebody um, on the other side at equal footing. Can you share a little bit about kind of some um, ways, some specific examples in which you have been an advocate for public defense or how you have partnered with public defense providers um, to, you know, advocate for effective assistance of counsel and making sure that the uh, constitutional right to counsel is being upheld. Um, and in addition, if there are things that you have tried that haven't worked, can you share those as well? Sure. Uh, so the, the one thing that I would really suggest is, you know, many times we as uh, criminal lawyers, we're very busy. Uh, many of us are government employees and we may see our job as, uh, say, eight to five during the day, and it doesn't go beyond those hours. 
you know, I think we, we need to remember that we are professionals and we're part of a big sort of operation, criminal justice. And uh, getting involved in your bar associations and other advocacy groups, like I said, I'm, I'm very active in the American Bar Association. And, you know, being part of something bigger than maybe just yourself or even your office can really help you to find ways that you can advocate for uh, things of this nature, such as right to counsel. When we were asking, we asked every year for uh, prosecutors to be part of the Council for Public Defense to put in their applications uh, to try to, to join. Uh, at first, honestly, we struggled. We struggled to get prosecutors to want to engage in this work. And it's only been through a lot of advocacy within our prosecutor groups, our prosecutor association, that this year we had to turn prosecutors away because we were full. Uh, on our slots that were allotted to prosecutors. It really takes people talking about these issues, not only in the public defense uh, arena, but also in the prosecutor arena that we get to the point where we understand that being adversaries in the courtroom is separate and distinct from being adversaries in policy work. Our job is much bigger if we're gonna be prosecutors and gonna be ministers of justice than just simply winning cases. It really is about ensuring fairness throughout the entire system. Uh, one of those things is, is flat out about funding. Uh, for many years, my office would go to war with the public defender's office in a fight for very finite dollars, finite resources. And, you know, it, it bred animosity between the offices. It bred animosity between the individual attorneys because you were afraid that you were gonna lose a position because they may win a position, you know? We've actually stopped doing that. And we found that if we can actually work together, we can come to solutions that work. And I would give you one example. In Washington State, uh, we prosecute people for not having uh, their driver's license because of their uh, ability or inability to pay fines. Uh, we knew that there were going to be changes to what our Supreme Court uh, set as standards, our caseload standards where public defenders in Washington State can only carry so many open cases at one time. Uh, the city of Spokane knew that this was coming and it would mean that we had to hire attorneys. And so we started talking about it collectively and found that we in our office felt as though prosecuting people for their inability to pay fines was really counterproductive. And so in a way to try to work with the city to reduce the amount of financial impact these caseload standards would have, uh, we decided that we would create a diversion program. So we would divert people that were uh, prosecuted normally for uh, suspended license violations into a community relicensing program that would seek to get their licenses back and put uh, fines into uh, manageable time payment plans. So we essentially got rid of a large amount of our caseload so that the public defenders would have fewer cases to defend and the system would have fewer attorneys to provide for because we were bringing fewer people to court. It was a win-win. Uh, it, it didn't happen uh, without us having conversations across those sort of imaginary lines that we've created. Uh, so my suggestion to the people on the call is uh, to be creative to engage in your bar associations, engage with your funders about how you can actually support public defense, but at the same time assist the prosecutors in what we're trying to do in our core function. It, it's possible. Great, thank you, Justin. Um, so now, if anybody has any questions, there's the Q&A box in the bottom right-hand corner. Please don't be shy. Um, we really just, you know, want to be as helpful to all of you as possible, so that's why we've left such a large amount of time at the end for Q&A. So, Justin, what would you say is the first step? Is it to get involved in the Bar Association, to talk to a public defender? What is the first step if somebody hangs up the phone today and says, great, I want to get involved and I want to be an advocate for the public defense system here in my jurisdiction. What is the first thing that they should do? Well, I think it really depends on the jurisdiction and how your makeup uh, is. A lot of jurisdictions 
have uh, assigned counsel, uh, so it, it's not as easy uh, simply because you may not have that centralized uh, point of contact for public defense. Uh, in Washington State and our larger jurisdictions, uh, we have in-house counsel, so the city of Spokane has a very robust uh, public defender's office. Uh, same thing the city of Seattle, uh, King County. That's not the case in many of our small jurisdictions where you may have one or two attorneys that have a contract to provide for this. So I know that I live in sort of a, a bubble uh, where we have robust public defense, uh, where we have uh, money that's going towards this cause. So in that case, if you're in a situation uh, like I am, it's, you know, I think it's to stop playing the petty games about who gets what money. Uh, but if it's in a, an area where maybe it's not uh, so centralized, it really would be on an advocacy point, uh, I think, through the bar associations. Uh, many of our bar associations want to do good work and to do advocacy work to further the field, to, to further the practice of law. And so I would really seek out what resources are available, whether it be on local bars or state bars or uh, nationally. Uh, we in the ABA uh, have a, a defense function uh, committee that really pushes hard on defense issues. And so there are many different avenues in which to be uh, part of. Uh, APA is an amazing organization that works hard to really broaden the focus on what effective prosecution is. Uh, NLIDA, uh, you heard the discussion about the, the joint project. Uh, there, there are good organizations that really want to push this work, and I think it's refreshing to see prosecutors become engaged in it simply because it's so sort of unusual. People, when you walk in the room and you give them your, your CV and they hear that you work on the Council for Public Defense, I'll tell you, that's usually the first thing people ask me. Well, what do you do there? Why are you part of that organization? I was expecting you to say you were doing this, 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 and this with prosecutor groups. And so it, it sort of just sort of changes the, the, the dialogue. Uh, oh, yeah, no, I work with public defenders because it's important for our system. It's important to ensure that justice is fairly metered out across uh, the board. So being part of these organizations, it, it's, it really can be useful. And honestly, at the end of the day, if you want something to do and you want to be involved, having a prosecutor walk in the room and want to do that, you're probably going to be taken up on that offer because there are not a lot of them that are raising their hands. Like I said, in Washington, it took several years when, uh, before we were able to independently solicit people to get involved. Uh, it wasn't overnight that magically prosecutors just started calling up uh, the state bar saying, can you put me on that council? No, it, it took a lot of time, effort, and networking to, to really get the word out that we need to be involved because we, we, we see firsthand the issues that are happening in the courtroom when counsel isn't present and we see firsthand what happens when the council isn't funded properly. Great, thank you, Justin. And Marlene, do you have anything to add to that um, or share some insight as to other ways that APA can be of assistance? Marlene, I think you're still muted. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, actually, as, as Justin was speaking, I was thinking a lot about um, our report and, and the different recommendations that we've set out based on the conversations that we've had. And a lot of the jurisdictions that did come to that, uh, that meeting, there were four of them, um, they were talking about, so these are successful jurisdictions that have had um, the ability to work together on that policy level but still maintain the traditional adversarial system within the courtroom. Um, and a lot of what they spoke about was the way they were able to go advocate on behalf of their own offices, but not only their own offices, they were able to advocate on behalf of both the prosecutors and the public defender's offices at the same time. Um, and by bringing each other to the table and by, by doing that together, it really did increase the um, ability for them to get the desired outcome that they were looking for. Um, and one of the other recommendations that we have from the report that um, I want to maybe ask Justin to talk about just a little bit, as you are the city prosecutor for Spokane, 
is um, the, the idea of culture change. So you were talking about how there's a lot of offices and there, there may be some prosecutors that um, are maybe trying to get involved, but they, there is a culture within the office that it is a very adversarial system. Um, and so as a city prosecutor, have you been able to, or how have you been able to get others involved and to kind of create this culture change within your office um, to engage all your staff or uh, a good portion of your staff within these collaborative efforts to, to try and get defenders and prosecutors to work together? That's actually an amazingly good question because culture is so pervasive when it comes to how prosecutors and public defenders and defense attorneys in general interact. Um, when I first started uh, 18 years ago, uh, it was made very clearly uh, to me, clear to me as a young attorney that public defenders were your enemy. Uh, they were out to sabotage your case. They were out to poke holes in your case and you were not to be friends with them. Uh, they were the, uh, your sworn enemy, if you will. Uh, and that was sort of, I, I, I was fearful of uh, being friends with public defenders. That, that literally, when that's the message that's coming from senior people in your office and you're a new attorney, how do you think you react? You do exactly what they tell you to do. And so it took a long time for me to sort of understand that they were completely and utterly wrong. Uh, and really, it was working in collaborative environments, those courts that I discussed that I've been involved in, our mental health court, our veterans court, community court, and our community license program. That was sort of the first taste as a line prosecutor uh, to see that they're far from the enemy. They are fighting every day just literally to do their job. Uh, when they're poking holes, they're holding me to my standard, to my burden. And so I think it's just engagement. One of the things I've done as a manager, uh, when we have different projects that involve different uh, uh, initiatives, I try to assign uh, attorneys to those things that may not normally fit into those roles. Uh, one of my toughest and probably most uh, defense unfriendly attorneys, uh, she was assigned to our DUI court. Uh, we were putting together a therapeutic DUI court, and everyone thought that I was insane. Uh, why would you put her in that project? She hates public defenders. She won't work with them. She is a prosecutor through and through. She can't be collaborative. Well, you know, it's weird because exactly the opposite has happened. Uh, being able to sit there and actually have conversations about the struggles, that their clients have, uh, struggles to get treatment for individuals, have really changed that particular attorney's um, perspective. And honestly, I, I am impressed and very, very proud of the work that she's done to put that court together, uh, to hold it to account, to use best practices, but also to really change sort of her own built-in preconceptions about what she should be doing in a courtroom. That's a single um, example, um, but there are others, and it really is just getting people together and actually having conversations to break barriers. It's pretty sad when that's really one of the main strategies is to have people talk, uh, because I think many times we in court, we're, we're afraid to, to show that we have a relationship with someone, whether it be a friendship or just a business relationship. Uh, because we don't want uh, the, the judge or, say, the client to think that maybe we're too chummy. Uh, but, you know, we can, we can have relationships. We can have that courtroom persona, but we can have a relationship to talk about issues that are common to ourselves and also to, to other people in our, our situation, uh, such as judges. So, I, you know, it's really, it's super basic, but I would say just assigning people to actually be engaged in policy work beyond you as the manager. Yes, thank you, and I'm so glad that you both brought up the importance of culture. Um, at the Rights Council National Campaign, we talk a lot about how there are kind of two arms of our theory of change and kind of changing our overall system. One is cultural and one is structural, and you can't really have one be effective without the other. Um, you need to embrace a culture that values 
all system actors and, pub and um, public defense, you know, specifically in this example, and uh, really value the universal kind of application and understanding and power behind the right to counsel, and also one that supports the application of it, of uh, the right to counsel, which would be kind of structural. And so it's really, you know, there are times where you might not be able to uh, get more funding, and so therefore, you know, it impacts some of the more structural policy reforms, but you can have an inclusive and a more um, uh, kind of re and relationship and in, um, collaborative kind of approach to public defenders and letting them know that they're valued, their clients are valued. Um, one thing, you know, I think as Justin mentioned earlier, combating stereotypes when people uh, are perpetuating this, you know, ragged hair, not as good, like totally scattered and probably public defender, step in and say this is not always true, you know, help to work to change that and change the image. And that's the smaller thing that one can do on a day-to-day -day basis without having to um, invest kind of more resources and policy changes. Um, so we got another question here. Um, have any of you heard of any prosecutors making charging decisions based upon the right to counsel? For example, bringing a less serious charge so as not to trigger that right to counsel. Um, Justin, why don't we start with you and then Marlene, if you want to take that second. Uh, yes, yes, I have heard of uh, this practice. Uh, in Washington State, it doesn't really apply because if it's a crime, it's a crime. Uh, you don't have, uh, you, we don't have tiers to where uh, the right to counsel attaches, but uh, going to meetings, especially on my, the ABA side of my work, you, you hear about this practice around the country where prosecutors are doing it. And honestly, uh, judges and other uh, funders want uh, prosecutors to do it because if you charge down to something that doesn't uh, attach the right of counsel, it, it just simply costs less. Um, I, I think it's, it's a very bad precedent, it's a bad practice. Um, I don't know how you stop it. Maybe Marlene can give some insights into that uh, from a national perspective. Marlene, do you have anything to add to that? Thanks, Justin. Yeah, I, I think as, as an, a national association, um, we are absolutely supportive of having uh, the right to counsel and uh, pro public defenders participate in the process um, as early as possible. Um, you know, we believe that if, if a person doesn't know what they're agreeing to or what they're pleading to, um, you know, and as Genevieve, as you said earlier, you know, it's not, it's not a proper, it, what, what really resonates, and I think this is how the Right to Counsel campaign can really participate and, and come into the fold here. Um, what you said earlier really rings true is what, what resonates with prosecutors is that they want this conviction to stick. Um, they want this to really work out and they don't want to have to deal with anything uh, in the future uh, that stems from this. So we are absolutely supportive of having the Right to Counsel and, and public defenders uh, in the process um, as early in the process as possible. Um, and so I know that there are a lot of uh, advocates such as Justin and such as, um, you know, other elected that are up on our board, very prominent members on our board from all different major counties within the country um, that are big advocates and big supporters of this and, and the Right to Counsel campaign. Um, so just having those voices out there and, and having um, that support can go a long way. Great, great, thank you both. Um, and I think we have time for one more question. If there's one out there, I'll give you all a minute to type it away. Um, all right. Well, I just want to thank everybody for taking the time. Um, before I turn to Marlene and Justin, um, I just want you all to know that if you um, are not familiar with our website already, um, it's up here, rtcnationalcampaign.org. I encourage you all to join up for our newsletters um, and share um, our information. I mentioned the roundtable report um, and the roundtables that we held with prosecutors and other system actors we will be releasing a report uh, later this week that shares all of those findings. Um, and, you know, if you are a champion of the right to counsel, you know, please 
join us, be a part of our campaign, um, go talk to other prosecutors, recruit other prosecutors to join on as well. Um, and then, you know, just stay tuned for more information to come. In addition to the actual hard copy of the report that we'll be putting up on our website and sharing on our listserv, um, the National Legal Aid and Defender Association is also putting together an interactive online um, communications toolkit. Um, that'll be coming out sometime this fall, early winter as well. Um, and, you know, in addition to looking at what this means for prosecutors, it'll have different sections for the other system actors that we spoke with as well, including law enforcement, judges, county officials, court administrators, and uh, representatives of state administering agencies. So I encourage you all to look there um, and share that information. Um, and with that, um, Marlene, I'm gonna turn it over to you for your closing remarks. Thanks, Genevieve. I'm not sure if we have time for one more question, but it does look like there is um, one more that just came in. Oh, yep, thank you for bringing my attention to that this day. Um, so the question that we have is, have you noticed the use of paralegals as resources um, been used to assist with the right to counsel? Um, and I'm not sure if this question is referring to defender's offices or prosecutor offices, um, but uh, if Shelby, if you can uh, clarify that, but I don't know if Marlene or uh, Justin, you have uh, first thoughts on that question. Well, I would say that, yes, uh, one of the big issues that public defender's offices have is uh, that they're just bare bones. And it comes down to this constant fight for funding. And whether it be paralegals to do the work of uh, getting the documents ready, uh, to really, I think the main area where we, we're seeing so much is the area of uh, investigations and getting expert witnesses in to challenge the state's uh, experts. And it really is a fight. It's a constant fight. Even a, a state like Washington, where we're pretty well funded on public defense, we still have these fights to be had. And you have prosecutors in many times trying to weigh in on decisions or requests for the court to provide funding for expert witnesses. And it, it just, you know, when it just feels icky, it probably is icky. Uh, and so I, I think we really just need to, to take a step back as prosecutors and not be so aggressive towards fighting the, the request for funds. We're, we're not, you know, public defender agencies aren't asking for the world. They're literally just asking for the ability to do a, a basic competent job. Uh, so whether it be funding for paralegals or other uh, assistive individuals, I, I think that really is important. And, you know, I'm sure that most offices would take a paralegal over uh, nobody, but uh, where it really comes down to is making sure there are enough attorneys in these public defense uh, offices that they can do the work and they can do it effectively and they're not overwhelmed with cases. And yeah, and I would also, oh, oh, sorry. Ahead, I was just going to say, I'm just going to quickly echo, I completely agree with Justin, um, and uh, yeah, that's all I was going to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, that's fine. I was going to say the exact same thing, and I will say um, that my, earlier, before I turned to policy work, I was actually an investigator for the D.C. Public Defender Service, um, which is one of, if, the, if not the um, most well-resourced public defender's office, and I was very lucky, um, but even even when we finally got a case and beginning the investigation, you're already so far behind. So while we had the resources, we didn't necessarily always have, you know, the time, or there was a lot of pushback when people would, when we would ask for continuances, and I think to be mindful of sometimes, you know, there are some things that are stacked up against the defense, and if they are defenders and their clients are just trying to put together a strong case, you know, figure out what is going on. Um, and so I think that's one of the same moments, you know, in addition to increasing the funding, but also just the, the constant, the caseloads and the timing of when cases are assigned, defend, defenders are often, you know, multiple steps behind. So that's where kind of a, um, I think paralegals, uh, access to investigators, law clerks also makes a big difference in that, in that regard. 
So I think, Marlene, if you have anything to add, please feel free to add. Um, but if not, just if you have any closing remarks. Yeah, uh, I just completely agree. And uh, I think, you know, as we said throughout, when the when the public defenders are more resourced and, you know, there's more funding and, and as you said, there's more attorneys and, and more uh, ability for them to work well uh, on their cases, then the whole system works more efficiently and, and more effectively. Um, and so with that, I just want to thank everyone who called in today. And um, I know I spoke a little bit about our report. If you want to review the report or learn more about the report, um, or anything else that APA is doing, um, either on the Rights Council or more generally, uh, feel free to visit our website, uh, apainc.org. Thank you. Thank you, Marlene. And Justin, now I'm just going to turn to you for closing remarks. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with everyone today. Um, I hopefully, I've uh, got something out of this. Uh, one of the, the things I would ask people to do is really look at these reports when the R2C report comes out and the, the publications that are available on APA's website. Uh, it, it's very interesting looking to see what people's perceptions of public defense are and maybe just helping everyone to, to find a way that they can really articulate the case for the right to counsel. Uh, honestly, it shouldn't be that hard. We're talking about a constitutional right. Um, but I guess things that are hard don't always come without effort. So we are um, we're we're in it uh, as prosecutors to help and uh, just read the reports and figure out maybe a way that you individually can do the same. Great, thank you. Um, and I just also really want to thank all of you for attending this webinar and thank Marlene and Justin for participating. Um, you've shared a lot of. Uh, really useful and practical information, and I really hope that it helps all of those on the webinar. Uh, my, my email and our website and social media information is up on the screen. Please feel free to send any follow-up questions or comments um, to me and stay tuned for those resources. And lastly, please, as you um, leave the webinar, uh, please fill out the evaluation. It really does help us plan for our future webinars um, and for future events where we talk about the right to counsel. So I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day and thanks again so much.